I am Paula Damasceno. I am a visual artist among many, many, many other things. I was born in Rio de Janeiro, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. I have been living in Greensboro since 2012. I am an African Brazilian woman of color, of heart, of culture. And thanks for having me here today. I think it started uh, very early in my childhood, basically having my grandparents being makers, my parents being history teachers, but flirting with art all the time, exposing us to global art and to local art in Rio de Janeiro, um, where I was born and raised. And so that very, that early childhood um, made me uh, understand much later, but made, made me make art. And I, um, when I was thinking about that question, I was realizing that all the way, the plan was to make art. There was no other plan. That, that has never been another plan for myself. Um, either my own plans or even um, my parents' expectations. Um, although it was not very clear, but I, when I look back now, it's totally clear that I have never experimented with something else. <laughs> and so uh, my first background uh, for years since childhood was really classic ballet, as many other um, female raised as a gender specific person, uh, which was great and gave me lots of things that I still use, you know, lessons on rhythm, just the, you know, the, the training music and the exposure to stage, uh, exposure to the costumes making of it. And it, I, I got to a point after 10 years that I had to decide, and that's when I decided, no, I don't want to starve myself. I don't want to spend hours training my body for that. And then from there, um, at the same time, I always had access to watercolor. My mom, too, nowadays, she's an excellent drawer, and, and she does this watercolor drawing things that I would never do. It's just incredible. <laughs> and like... Well, so these materials, those um, implements were all around us. And so then I moved to theater, um, kind of naturally, stage arts. And I was on theater for a good 10 years. And also at some point I realized, yeah, what I like the most uh, will not give me a good living. Like Rio de Janeiro has one market, it's for TV soap operas. And I had a really small, thin threshold on, on that. Um, being a person of color, I would, now it's much better, but at the time I would be giving like roles that I was not interested in uh, performing. And so I had, I was looking for something else. And then at some point, then I moved on to video making, documentary making. I had this also background, my parents being history teachers, I myself had had a short uh, academic career in history that I stopped at the, that point. And so it was a great uh, way to mix um, like household knowledges and like my desire to learn other medium other than um, my using my body. And so I always loved cameras. I always loved like recording VHS. I always like I was the one who knew how to do it at home, and so it was great. And that that took me to experiences that I uh, carry on with me, and that took me to Vietnam. It took me to Germany. It took me to Colombia, to Mexico, and finally, it brought me to Greensboro, to elsewhere. Well, I will say again, my grandparents were makers, were seamstress, um, furniture making, designers and makers from that time where 
you were the designer and the maker in your own workshop in the back of your house. They taught me in like small lessons how to handle tools, how to organize a workshop, how to pursue that while doing other stuff as well for to make a, uh, to, to make a living. So they are my primary influencers. Music in the sense that music comes into an object. I had to handle that object, not only to listen to it. I'm not a musician, so it's not much an influence, a direct medium-like influence, but the objects that carry on this, the, the songs, the covers, the albums, they, they in, like when I was really young, they started to um, affect me affect my eyes and the way I saw the world. Um, then after the experiences I have, I have had multiple Brazilian artists that I can uh, tell you a little bit. So, as I said, Ruben Valentin, Mario Cravo Neto, Rosana Paulino recently too, um, the object aspect of it and the conceptual aspect of it. Like uh, Rio de Janeiro is heavily influenced by conceptual artists like Silda Meirelles and um, uh, Antonio Manuel, um, and so, and of course, Elio Chisica, Ligia Clark, Ligia Papi, um, all conceptual arts are artists that um, heavily worked with objects, animating ob objects, reanimating objects, appropriate, appropriating um, art that had already being made or objects that are just for consumption and transforming it into art by inserting certain messages within this um, object. So that relationship um, between object, culture, politics, aesthetics, um, that is much like um, what I have learned and kind of observed from Brazilian Rio de Janeiro artists, mainstream artists, let's say this way. And then in, in the United States, Gary Mae Williams, Lorna Simpson, working with photographs and say no photographs. Uh, archives, archives, I would put my hands on archives and I would tell my story about archives. And those are like, Things that I I keep thinking on and on and going and looking at work and saying, oh, I wish I could. That's a, that's what I really I really would love have loved to do that. Now then now I I'm carrying my whim say it beautifully. Just like it, get it, and bend it to your own will. And of course she has a heavy hand and she does it. So what I'm working on is developing that hand that is obviously not only hand, it's a, it's a whole being bending something to my own will. But um, that was basically, I guess, one of the unforgettable things that I've learned listening to Carrie Mae Williams' uh, lectures and looking at her work as well. because I got this email from elsewhere, the Living Museum in Greensboro downtown, saying, uh, asking if I wanted, inviting me to apply for a residency here. I received the invitation and I applied for a, for a grant and I got the grant and I came to elsewhere. And when I came to elsewhere, uh, I think it, my first impression was of total delight. First of all, because it was uh, still, it was, it is still, but it was even more there then. It was this town that was recovering for some, from, from something. And I didn't know what it was. And I think it's still recovering from, uh, from some things that happened. But downtown where elsewhere is, and the story of the building help, helped me to understand and then I decided to make a documentary about the Carolina Theater. And I did, and through that documentary, the, what I discovered, what was uh, that Greensboro needed to heal. 
and um, one of the, the interviewees, uh, actually a couple, uh, more than 80 years old couple of teachers, um, African-American teachers, um, took me to the third floor at, of the Carolina Theater to tell their stories and to tell, to show me, and of course, to, to put in the documentary where people used to go to watch movies in the Carolina Theater, where African American were segregated to watch their movies. And at the end of my residency, I was told that that was the 85th anniversary of the Carolina Theater. Why not to apply for our grant to come back after I went back to Brazil, to come back to Greensboro and do make an extended version of the documentary to present in October of 2012. And I did, and I got the grant from the Humanities Council of North Carolina. And so I came back to elsewhere, to Greensboro, that time to put together the CEO of the Carolina Theater, which uh, was Keith Holiday, the former mayor of Greensboro, and uh, the president, the CEO of the Civil Rights Museum, on the stage to celebrate the 85th anniversary of the Carolina Theater, and to talk about their differences, and um, to talk about also, more importantly, um, how the city was having a chance that night to heal a little bit about the segregation and the racism um, and the civil rights history of Greensboro. So that was what happened in 2012. And in the process, I fell in love. And Greensboro gave me that love, put on my lap. And I embraced it and I stayed in Greensboro. Right now I am working on multiple things, but one thing that is new to me um, is a series of photographs uh, that I have been working on made at the in, in the inner river in Durham uh, that just accidentally started in uh, during COVID-19. I found a camera person in Durham that is excellent, beautiful little store to fix my camera. And, but the fact is I got the camera and I went to the Inner River and started to work. And as I started to work, I started to work with scale in a way smaller scale that I'm used to see um, in photo nature photographs. I got myself doing really like weird movements and holding poses to get a small part of a stone in the river, in the water, because what I think it was going on and kept going on and will keep going on as far as I keep going there is study scale and what are the emotional, what is the emotional landscape? that I very close to the object, reduced the scale in a vast nature space, can offer to the eyes, instead of a landscape that is showing the beautiful, and photographs that do that are beautiful and I love them. But I, I, got, I cut myself going in and reducing everything and cutting out and going in those sacred objects. There are the stones there, the water there. I almost think that each of them are uh, have their own entity, their own energy, their own. So that's really new to me. Photograph nature, period. No people, no, no specific culture around it no specific cosmology around it. It's just what the river is telling me there. So that's new to me and I'm very excited about it. This work on the inner river reminds me again of a song from one of these early childhood experiences that I still listen nowadays from a musician called Rita Lee Jones, Rita Lee. She actually is an American Brazilian, but 
um, um, that she says, she's talking about music and Brazilian popular music, and she's a rock and roll musician. She, at the, at the time when she composed that specific song. And in the, the lyric goes, uh, Rita Lee had to crash the party to make, to, to be successful. She had, and then somehow I think that has always been my thing, like crash that party. Yeah, there is a party there on landscape nature. I need to crash that party to be in because I was not invited to. And I guess that goes into like, that goes into identities and where I come from. I, I do come from a household where we did have lots of access to information and education and art and culture. But I'm a brown, African Brazilian women most of the time. And I was not invited to certain parties. Cer certain parties are not, no, you know, for me, I do have to crash that party. And so I'm talking about that visually. My day looks like working at my job and then working at my art. And then weekends is only most of the time separated for uh, well being and art making, which because I have a full time job to make art becomes well being. So I am complete, I am whole. It's not that I, I make art nonstop, it's that I have to make art to then go to sleep and feel whole. The pandemic, besides the negative aspects of it, the anxiety, I didn't personally lose anyone, but it, the sadness of so many people just uh, being defeated by uh, the disease and the mismanagement of the disease, uh, that is pretty much, I believe, very similar to everyone else. Individually and personally, it, it provided me a chance to focus even more on what I like and why I like and how I like. And so I have been much more sharp with what I want to say with my art, what I want to say with my job, what I want to say with my master degree, and what I want to work. And as I said, the the series of photographs at the in, the Inno River are, I believe, a little bit mirroring that need and that capacity of rescaling things and choosing exactly the scale that you want to work things out. So that is something that I can, I can say, it's not necessarily between negative or positive, but that's one effect that COVID had on, on me. And it's also, I didn't, I couldn't go just anywhere. It was like, actually when I started that was shut down. So River sounded like the safest place for me to go. And so from there, uh, I, I just kept going. But just like on a, a, a more clear awareness of where I stand with my own choices and the effect of my choices also in the broader community. with the fact that when ideas come to me or I look for them in whichever way you have an idea or you discover an idea, then you have to cue that idea by actually making it come, come to fruition, come to life. And I do struggle with that part because it's so beautiful in my mind. And also I can like tell myself how great I am by having that idea and, you know, visualizing little things that could happen as an effect of that idea and spend a whole lot of time on that. Which I do spend a lot of time 
because on the other hand, I think time is uh, under um, rated as an important thing before to actually do something. Um, I had difficulties during school because I never wanted to have an idea, go to the workshop, put the paper, get the camera, go down because you have to do it immediately. And I, I have another time, but I do struggle when that time is over. I do struggle too <laughs> to say, Paula, it's overthinking. You know, thinking it's done for now, it's, it, it will come again during the process, a time where you have to stop and think or you need to stop and think. But I struggle with that first moment of killing that uh, in my own head pleasure of making myself feeling good and even visualizing how good the world will see. <laughs> you know, yeah. That's just one of the, the struggles. <laughs> I think there's a place for different uh, purposes um, of art making. Um, I think there are artists who are much more concerned with politics, with using the art to um, talk about politics or to make art that is political in itself and that is beautiful. There are artists that just want to make, you know, um, beautiful, uh, eye-catching, very formal work, uh, just because they feel like that's important part of life, of culture to have. Um, ways to look at colors, shapes, lines, um, and formal aspects of objects uh, in ways that touch people in different um, levels. So I think there are all these out there and I think they all are great. I don't, I don't see the need to have one specific function for art at all. I think we do live in a, in a time that maybe we are kind of pushing for that in a way or another, but I, I don't think we need to do that. I don't think we should do that. I think we should let art and artists define their their relationship to society in multiple ways because society in itself it's multiple it's not a big chunk of thing that we should do art for some reason 